Fire Radio. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Uh, I didn't think we needed a microphone. I got a big mouth, so you should be able to hear me uh, throughout the room. Uh, as soon as Sam got up to talk, we lost two tables of people. Way to go, Sam. Um, real quick, so thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I appreciate it. I'm going to go into uh, this program tonight. It's a generational talk. It talks about the young, talks about the old, and I hold everybody accountable, including myself. Um, on top of that, you guys all power calls out here? Is that a thing? Yeah, I believe it. Um, so um, what's it called? So where I'm going to go with that is the first part of this is my story. I want to give you a background about who I am because I think that matters when we start talking about the other points throughout the presentation. So I'm going to give you a little backstory about myself. Then we're going to roll into the generational conversation, and then we're just going to punch out a bunch of issues that we're dealing with in the fire service. Unlike other programs that are out there, this is not a tactics and strategy firefighting program. What's funny about that is that we should be talking 90% in the fire service about strategy and tactics, and yet everybody wants to complain and talk about culture and tradition. We have our values flip-flopped in the fire service. We should be talking every single day about being better on the fire ground and not worried about what's happening in our firehouses, but we have it completely backwards. I get phone calls, text messages, direct messages, DMs all day long about culture issues, leadership issues, problems in the fire service. Nobody ever wants to talk about tactics and strategy. That's a problem. That means we're not doing our best in-house. Outside, when the trucks go out, we're doing okay. When we back in is where we start having problems. We need to flip-flop the conversation and really start talking about strategy and tactics because everything else should already be in place. And so anyway, that's what tonight's gonna be about. I start off my program with the Aloha slide. Last year, I had an opportunity to go to Maui, Hawaii, to see firsthand the devastation that happened in Lahaina. So National Fire Radio has been around for six years now with our podcast, social media platform. We had an open invitation to go document the fires. In five days, I interviewed 22 different people from complete engine companies that almost lost their lives that day, politicians, residents, people that lost everything, and everyone else in between, cultural leaders, you name it. I sat down with 22 different people and interviewed them about the fires that occurred that day. But something stood out to me through all that tragedy. There was a lot of parallels between the Hawaiian culture and the American fire service. Aloha, the spirit of family, the ohana, these are things that matter to the Hawaiian people and they carry those values and traditions deep within their heritage. They don't care who you are, everybody has a place in the Hawaiian culture. You could be the bottle washer or the governor and there's a mutual respect between each. There's a mutual care, love, sense of family. That's what the Hawaiian culture stands for. And after all that tragedy that I saw firsthand, that experience, that week that I spent in Lahaina changed my life. It made me better. It made me understand that life is small. And we only have a little bit of time here on this planet to make an impact. And so that changed me. And I was able to take my wife and children with me. And it was an incredible experience that I'll never forget. So much so that just this past week, I went down to North Carolina for four days and was on the front lines up in the mountains, up in Bat Cave, Girton, Garren Creek, small little towns that got wiped off the map. And I was, went down there with the idea to do the same, capture stories, talk to those on the front line, talk to the USAR guys and girls that are there, talk to the teens, talk to the people that lost their homes, the fire departments. I put all the camera gear down and all the interview equipment away, and we went to work for four days down there. There was so much work to be done that National Fire Radio didn't matter. We went to work as a brother. Tragedy happens. Thankfully, Florida was not as bad as they were saying. But these events happen. It's what we do with them. And it comes down to a sense of pride, ownership, and community. Community matters. The Hawaiian culture believes in community. That's what the fire service is built on. So I want to talk about this, family. Family's everything to me. I mentioned my daughters and my wife. I was able to take them to Hawaii last year with me. They saw what I do firsthand with National Fire Radio. They saw what happened in Lahaina. Right here on the left is my father. My father's over a 50-year member of the fire service. He's my hero. He's my idol. I'm going to talk a lot about him in the first part of my program. In the middle is myself, my daughter, Lily, who's my youngest. 
my father and my two brothers, and then it's myself and Lily. Lily's 16 years old, grew up in the firehouse, never thought for a second she'd want to be a firefighter. A month before she was eligible to join at 16, she comes into my bedroom and says, Dad, I think I'm ready to join. Join what? I said, the firehouse. I said, you're not joining. Shame on me. That was my place. That's my house. Those guys know me. I'm 30 years in that firehouse. I didn't want my daughter to have that inside track. I didn't want her to see me there. I didn't want to expose her to what we do. I felt terrible about that. And within 24 hours, I flip-flopped my attitude completely. And I'm so grateful I did. I was protecting her as a father. I didn't understand until I had time to think about it how important the fire service has been in my life. The fire service has given me everything in my life. Now, I'm going to go into my story, and you're going to hear it firsthand. But I'm absolutely grateful for what the fire service has done to me. It's made me who I am today. It's created relationships and friendships with guys that I would have never have had the opportunity to call friends, brothers, chiefs. It's important to me, and it should be very important to you. When you go all in, the fact that you guys are here tonight tells me that you're all in. Because you could be somewhere else tonight, but you choose to be here. So I shouldn't be talking to you guys. I need to be talking to the people that aren't here. But since you're here, I'm going to talk your ear off. But the point is, this has given me so much of my life, and I'm so grateful for it. And I've only come to realize that as I've gotten older and have matured. And as you'll see as my story goes on, I was an absolute piece of shit when I was younger. And I'm going to tell you all about my faults and how terrible I was, and I'm so grateful for where I am today. This is the other family business. Tri-State Bearing and Supply Company was created in 1980. It was a ball bearing and power transmission company. It was an absolute punchline when I'd go out and people go, what do you do for a living? I'd say, I'm a ball bearing salesman. Ridiculous, right? But I was. I grew up in the family business. From eight years old, I worked there and I held every position in the company up to vice president of operations. I grew up in an independent distributor that battled, fought, cheated, stole, did whatever we could to get an order or a quote within the industry. We worked our tails off. I watched my father from early on work seven days a week, 12, 14 hours a day, come home and then give back to the community as a firefighter, a councilman, and a mayor. My father is an incredible man. He's 82 years old, and he's still showing up at the firehouse at 2 o'clock in the morning to get the truck on the road if he needs to. He's an incredible human being, and I'm very proud to be his son. But I can tell you this, growing up in the family business and seeing that work ethic, his hard work gave me everything. I grew up in an upper-middle-class neighborhood. I was entitled. Things were given to me. I had a four-year college education that was paid for. I didn't have struggle in my life. I was the big kid, so I was a bully, and I was an absolute piece of shit. Uh-oh. Hang on. This was me. Tommy Callahan, big Tom Callahan's son. If you guys don't know who Tommy Callahan is, you're doing life wrong, I promise you. This was me, fat, drunk, and stupid. So growing up, I had the opportunity to go to college on a lacrosse division one opportunity. I went to a division one school to play lacrosse, got recruited to play there. I threw it away within two weeks because girls and booze and going to fires was more important. I'm serious. I threw away a division one lacrosse career because I was Tommy boy. I went away to college. My parents paid for my college. First thing I did when I got there, I figured out where the bar was, where the girls were and where the firehouse was. Priorities in life. Meanwhile, I should have been disciplined. I should have been in the gym. I should have been working out more, running, getting up at 5 o'clock, going to the double sessions, training, working hard. I didn't do that. I found what was more important to me at the time was chasing girls, drinking beers, and going to the fires. And so at college, I ended up joining a combination department up there within two weeks of being at college. I loved firefighting. Firefighting to me has always been something super special. 
When I was a little kid, I would read Fire Engineering Magazine cover to cover three times a month, and then I would save each one of them. I was a student of the game. Firehouse Magazine, you look at it for the pictures. Fire Engineering, training articles, mentorship, leadership. They both had their place, and man, did I eat them up. They were my magazines, and that's from like 14 years old on. I loved the fire service. And so when I got to college, I seeked out the firehouse, threw away my lacrosse career, and went all in on the combination fire department. They had three paid guys at the time that worked day tour, one paid guy at night. I spent so much time there that I became an equal. I lived in with them. I cooked with them. I rode out with them. And at the time, in the city of Poughkeepsie, New York, it was burned up, boarded up, or empty lots. A lot of fires in the mid-90s. We had a really good time. So if I didn't want to go to the bar, I'd go to the firehouse on a Friday night. We'd catch a fire. It was a lot of fun. Spent a lot of time. I cut my teeth in Poughkeepsie, New York, and I really learned the fire service. But here's my dilemma. 20 years old, I had the opportunity to get hired in Fairview. Poughkeepsie was hiring. I had the opportunity to get hired. And I had a moment where I realized that I was starting to grow up a little bit. And I could have taken that job at 20 years old, but I deferred it. I felt that if I didn't graduate college, I threw away all the hard work my parents put into me in allowing me to go to college. And so I deferred the job thinking it would be there again for me so I could finish college. Well, the job did come around again, but I was still in college. Deferred it a second time. I ended up graduating, moving back home, Job opportunities dried up, and well, I went to work for the family business full-time. Tri-state bearing. It's what I knew. So I come home from college. My father hands me an American Express card, gives me a car and a briefcase, and says, go be an outside salesman and learn the business. Again, gave me everything I needed to succeed. And what did I do? Fat, drunk, and stupid. I was the best entertainer. I would take clients out for dinners and drinks and golf and events. Man, I was so freaking good at that. I didn't know jack shit about our family business. And that's a problem. 2008, 2009 rolls around. The economy dumps out. There's a big correction. Another one's coming soon, I think. There was a big correction. My father says, Jeremy, I need to meet with you. I meet with him and he says, hey, it's you or a couple employees. The business isn't doing well. Cash flow's tight. We got to lay people off. You haven't done shit for the company. Excuse my language, I get passionate. You haven't done anything for the company. Do I keep my own son or do I let people go? That very day, I had to make a decision that I was never going to be a career fireman. That day, I decided to stay with the family business. That was hard. That was hard. Because now I had to grow up, finally. Amex got taken away. The personal vehicle got taken away. The expense account got taken away. And I had to go sit behind a desk and answer telephones and actually learn the family business. The funny thing about that is I actually got really good at it. And we started growing the family business. And I started moving my way up through the company pretty quickly. I had this sense of obligation to my parents like I did with college that I started realizing that I owed them. They did everything for me. It was now my turn to do for them. That's called maturity. I say a lot on the podcast, with maturity comes clarity. I believe that. I think as you get older and you traverse the landscape and you understand life a little bit better, you start to have some clarity. And that's where I am today. And I'm going to tell you about this part coming up in a minute. So. I start learning the business. I start building the business on the back of social media. I start realizing that social media can help us grow our small family distributorship in New Jersey. And very quickly, we start to grow. Things are going well. So much so that my father was looking for an exit. We were going to buy him out. I had two brothers in the company. My two brothers are older than me. They were in the photo before here. My brother Chris and my brother Greg, they're both older. I'm the youngest of three boys. The problem was the youngest of three boys was running the business now. 
that doesn't work well in a family dynamic. If any of you are involved in a family business, it's not easy. And what happened was resentment creeps in. You're working so hard, it's not evenly shared or distributed between family members. And so now I'm working six days a week, 12, 14 hours a day, building the family business, but I have brothers who aren't committed like I am. Causes resentment. We're all firefighters together. All of a sudden, our holidays are only being spent Christmas and Easter and Thanksgiving. If that, we're not doing picnics anymore. We're not hanging out with each other anymore. Resentment creeps in in family businesses. I see some of you shaking your head, so you understand where I'm going with this. It was time to make a change. My father was looking to get out. I was looking to take over, and I was going to buy the company with my two brothers. We were working out the shares. We were close to penning the deal. And literally the night before we closed, this guy right here got cold feet. And uh, I was my dad's rising star, right? I'm his youngest boy. You can see I'm getting emotional about it because it still crushes me. I told my father that morning, I went in, sat down, the attorneys, the accountant, everybody sitting there. And I pushed away from the table and told them I didn't want to buy the company. I needed more time to think about it. That was one of the hardest decisions I ever had to do in my life was tell my idol, my father, I didn't want his business. But I came to realize it was time for me to go do me. The business was successful because of my hard work and the foundation that my father put into it. I'm not taking anything away from my family members, but there are certainly key people in businesses that create them to where they are. I pushed away. I told him I was not interested in purchasing the company. I needed more time to think about it. I went home and told my wife, I think it's time for me to do me. Running my father's business, it was his business. I built that business for him. When we sold the business in an acquisition, six months later, we got a phone call. And six months after that, we ended up selling the company to a business out of New England. Gave my father his exit, and it allowed for me to start doing what I wanted to do. I felt that the fire service was missing. I said to my wife, I go, man, the fire service is missing. We have two institutions, fire engineering and firehouse, and neither of them are innovating. Neither of them are talking to young guys and girls in the fire service. They're not communicating on the channels of which people consume content. Print is dying. People are not reading page 17. Where is the attention? And then how do we go get it? And I said to my wife, based on the social media that I was able to build and understand to build my family business, I said, I think I could bring that to the fire service and we can kind of create a little bit of disruption. We can start reaching the younger generations. And something else that was sticking at my chops were all the guys that were leaving the job. And I'm going to talk about the job. When I say the job tonight, career volunteer, I don't care if fire is fire. It's a job, okay? So when I talk about the job, it's a job for anyone. So many guys were leaving the job pissed off and disgruntled after 20, 25, 30 years. The fire service spit them out. They had an impeccable career up until the last few years, and then all of a sudden, they become angry, disgruntled, the new generation, terrible leadership, poor administration. They got screwed for promotion. They didn't get the support they expected. And after 20 years of an incredible fire service career, the last few years are tarnished and they leave disgruntled. You know what they do when they leave? They take everything with them. We can't have that in the fire service. The fire service is built on those that came before us. Gentlemen and ladies that have put their time in to build the frame and foundation from which you get to sit here tonight. That's incredibly important, and we cannot lose sight of that. So the podcast was, hey, I talk a lot. I could do a podcast. So I said, let's capture the stories in perpetuity. Let's talk to the senior man. Let's capture those stories so that when they do leave, we have their stories where people can consume them. I don't know if you listen to the podcast or not. I hope you do. It does very well. Last year, we had a million and a half downloads. This year, we'll be over 2 million downloads. 
Our podcast is on fire. It's awesome because I get to talk with great people to share their knowledge, insights, and experience. That is what we need in the fire service. So National Fire Radio quickly became a podcast and social media platform protecting the integrity of the job. That's it. We do a lot of different types of stuff. And what I found along the way was not only do we do social media content, not only do we do the podcast, but believe it or not, what none of you see is what actually runs National Fire Radio, which is a media and marketing company on the back end. We work with major manufacturers in consultation, creative, design, execution, and delivery against our community. See, in six years, we work super hard to build community. That's what National Fire Radio truly is. I'm honored when I walk in here tonight and people know who I am before I got here. That's crazy to me. It happens to me everywhere I go. But it tells me that I'm doing something right. Full transparency and 100% authentic. My story is my story. I'm going to tell you I was a terrible person growing up. I was the bully on the school bus. I'm going to tell you a story about my black eye. That I had to walk around for three months with a black eye because I was a piece of garbage. I'm going to tell you about the times that I wasn't good. That I didn't do my best in the firehouse. That when I was a younger officer in my volunteer firehouse, I knew everything and I couldn't be told differently. We're going to go through this whole thing tonight. That's where we are in the fire service. We have to talk about this. And if I'm the guy that's going to share his story, maybe we can open up a few other people to start having honest conversations about who they are and where they are in their fire service career. Community and delivery, this is super important to me. This one's huge. If we educate every 16 to 36-year-old, that means when they're 26 and 46, 36 and 66, they know National Fire Radio. We have the ability to maintain the integrity of the job. That means we can tell you the good stuff. We create authentic content. If you look at our social media page on any of the, on any of the platforms, it is 100% original content. I don't repost. We don't just share fire porn. I don't do any of that. There's no value in that. There is. Don't get me wrong. Like, you can scroll. I, I scroll and look at all those pages, too. But for National Fire Radio, it was important for us to maintain the integrity by being able to do our own creative. And that is exactly what we do. The job. The job is the job. We all do the job. I've had plenty of conversations with career firemen, volunteer firemen, paid on call, forestry, you name it. I travel the country. I do this program, but I also sit down at kitchen tables across the country in firehouses and just shoot the shit for hours and hours and hours. And that's where the value is. When I can sit and talk with incredible people and learn about how you operate, who you are, watch the passion come out of you. I love going in the firehouses and talking with guys and watching the senior man circle us. They circle. They're like, I don't know who this chubby kid is in my firehouse. I don't know why he's here looking at our trucks. He's talking to you guys like he knows something. And then the senior man hears something. I go, Billy, right? Your name, Billy? Billy, what's, what's this guy's name? Do you know him? Do you know this guy? Yeah. Who's that? Jimmy. Jimmy. I go, Billy, what's that guy's name? That's Jimmy. Hey, Jimmy. What's this picture on the wall? Were you at that fire? Jimmy's like, yeah, I was down on Main Street. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Circle around, a little more conversation. And now Jimmy's getting a little bit closer. And now we ask Jimmy again, Jimmy, that fire on Main Street, first do? What was it? Fire out a couple windows on arrival? Did you have jumpers? What was it? Yeah, you know, this and that. Before you know it, Jimmy's in the middle of the circle taking over. And the young kids like Billy are sitting there going, holy shit, I've never heard these stories before. All it takes is a catalyst. All it takes is somebody to get the conversation going. This is where we go with this conversation tonight is that generational talk. We all share something in common. It's called being a firefighter. So let's not let all the other bullshit get in the way. That's how we get Billy and Jimmy together. And I do it across the country. So the job is the job. If you have a problem with that, I'll meet you in the parking lot afterwards. The job is the job. I don't care if you get a paycheck or not because I know volunteer firemen that are better than career firemen, and I know career firemen that are better than volunteers. It doesn't matter. We have all types. 
whether you get a paycheck or not. And I'm guilty. Every single thing I talk about tonight, I violated. I am not standing here preaching. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking with you. I am, am going to be guilty of everything we talk about tonight. I'm guilty of. The greatest generation, World War II, you know them as the greatest generation. They're impacted by the, I'm sorry, born 1901 to 1925, ages 99 to 122. We might have a few of these gentlemen left, and if we do, God bless them. Known as the greatest generation. They were impacted by the Great Depression, super frugal. They didn't spend money because they didn't have money. Majority were soldiers that fought in World War II. The silent generation, this is the generation my father grew up in. 1942, he was born, he's 82 years old. The silent generation is the smallest generation. They were impacted by World War II in the greatest generation, so they didn't have as many people. They were hard workers. They put their heads down and worked. They were part of the, the McCarthy-era government tactics. And so they stayed within the system. They didn't venture outside of the lines. That's my father, hard incredible work ethic. My father raised his family from 12 years old on up. His father died early on. My grandfather never met him. Guy, when my dad was young, my dad worked 17 jobs just to raise his family. And that's why he has the work ethic that he has. And I have the respect for him that I do. Baby boomers. We got plenty of these guys in the fire service today. 59 to 77, especially in our volunteer houses. Uh, they're, mo they're one of the most relative generations in modern society. They're super dynamic, they're hardworking, um, they're independent, they're often misunderstood like millennials, and we'll get to millennials in a minute because we like to blame them for everything. They're agents of social change. They were a part of the Vietnam movement, civil rights, flower power, that, those type of movements, free spirits, hardworking yet had fun, baby boomers. The other thing with baby boomers too, which is really fun, and I'm sure there's a bunch in the room, you guys love to compete with your kids. That's a fun characteristic of baby boomers. They like to compete with their children more than most generations. Generation X, this is the best generation because this is my generation. Uh, born 65 to 79, 44 to 58. I am 47. I know I look 30, but I'm 47 years old. We, what was that? watching you. So here's the fun thing, right? My generation, I grew up knowing what it was like to leave for the day and not have anything in my pockets. We'd leave the neighbors, you know, my, the kids in the neighborhood, their parents were allowed to parent me. We'd leave in the morning, come back when the street lights came on, right? I'm sure you've all heard that before, but it's very true. There was no accountability. My parents had no idea where I was during the day. And then as we grew up, we learned technology. So my generation, Generation X, knew life before the technology boom and certainly after where we are today. So for me, my first email address was 1995, my freshman year of college. And before I got my Marist College email address, I had my AOL chat room that I was trying to pick up girls in, right? Like we all, you know, typing age, sex, location, right? Like some of you guys get that, right? So that, that was when I was 18 years old. So we knew life before we know life after. The other interesting thing about Generation X is we are the bridge. Because we knew simpler times and we know today, we bridge the gap, this program, bridging the gap. We take Billy and Jimmy and I push them together. I want these two separated generations to come together to find middle ground. Generation X people are the ones that typically bring that forth in an environment. Make sense? Millennials. Freaking millennials, man. No. I say that in jest. Be thank you. I say that in jest because my father, 82 years old, blames everything in the world on millennials, and he doesn't even know what one is. It's an easy punchline. But the thing with millennials is they're a lot older than you think. Millennials are 29 to 43. I have a 30-year-old. I have a 28-year-old. I have 17 and 16. Michael is 30. Kendra is 28. They're both my stepchildren. They've been mine since they were five and six. And then my wife and I have two together, Paige and Lily. Paige is 17. She's a high school senior. And Lily's a high school junior. She joined the fire department. 
unbelievable kids. Michael's getting married in November, super cool, draining me out of pocket. I got no money left in my pocket. Um, he's getting married, but he is to the T what we would consider to be a millennial. So they're greatly misunderstood and often mislabeled. They're tech savvy. They appreciate constructive feedback. This is really important when we start talking about the firehouse and communication within the firehouse. Millennials want to be told what is needed. They want to understand what needs to be done. And they want to know if they're doing it correctly. For guys like me and older guys in this room, that is super hard for them to grab a hold of. If you think about that, I never wanted to be criticized. I never wanted to have constructive criticism. I do now in life. But when I was young, never. I knew everything. I didn't need to be told. This generation, the millennials from 1980 to 1994, they want to know where they fit in. They need to be told where they can be, how they can be, how they can operate. And they want to know what the parameters are. It's super important when we talk about that. And we're gonna go, we're gonna go into all this as we go on through the conversation and we start hitting on some key words. Gen Z is 95 to 2012, 11 to 28. They're exposed to social media and they were the first generation to really start dealing with social issues, okay? So my kids, Kendra's 28, she's on the cusp, but Kendra, Kendra's 28 and she's like Gen Z or Gen X. She's like me, super cool, like gets it. She doesn't get caught up in any of the nonsense. She's just, she's cool. She's a free spirit. My other two girls, they are Gen Z, no doubt, right? 16 and 17, right in the thick of it. They're entrepreneurial, diversity and inclusion. My daughter's friend group looks nothing like my friend group did when I was growing up. I can't even pronounce half the names of their friends. I have to ask them time and time. And I don't mean, I mean that in the most loving way possible. Their friends are every shape, size, color, ethnicity, race, religion. It's so diverse today. I grew up, every, we had, a couple black kids, a couple Asian kids, a couple Egyptian kids, and then everybody was white. That's how I grew up. The world has changed dramatically, and it's for the better because my kids don't see race. They don't see religion. They see a person. They are literally blind to all of the preconceived things and stereotypes that existed throughout other generations. I think it's a beautiful thing. I really do. They appreciate work-life balance. I only know how to work. It's very rare that I get life. Life is work. I talk about the fire service later on in this conversation. You guys all understand this because you're here tonight. Firefighting is a lifestyle. It's not a job. It's not a volunteer association. It is a lifestyle. When you look around, at who your friends are, the people you run with, the people you talk to, you confide with, you vacation with, you put your life on the line, you watch social media, you watch things that involve firefighting. It is a lifestyle. When you go all in on the fire service, we win. It is a lifestyle. It is not a career or volunteer organization. Okay? It's much, much more than that. With Gen Z, they're exposed to the social issues. I think about sitting down with my daughters at dinner and my dinner conversations with them is very much different than the conversation I had with my, kid, with my parents growing up. We talk about abortion, voting rights, Donald Trump, uh, you know, uh, healthcare, COVID, uh, going to the moon again. We talk about all these social issues, the climate, I never talked about that stuff at 16 years old. All I wanted to do was hang out with girls and get in trouble. My kids want nothing to do with that. They both have great boyfriends in high school. They're great guys. They're nice kids, very polite, good kids. But they are so much more ahead of the curve than I was growing up at their age. So that parlays into your firehouse. That comes into your culture. You have to understand that the younger people coming into our firehouses today are very much different than I was, than Chief Horst was, okay? So things change. And we, as an institution, do have to change with that. It doesn't mean we sacrifice values 
and into the important stuff, but there are ways in which we can communicate that we have to find our way to get there if we want our organizations to be successful. Gen Alpha, 2013 to 2025, zero to 10, youngest generation in the United States. They learn by watching, they're open-minded. This is the first generation that grew up with parents with technology. These are the kids that are at dinner tonight. Before I got here, I stopped just to grab a, a quick bite. And the, the mom and dad are sitting at the table and the baby, I mean, the baby's not even one in the stroller and they have the phone up playing. And halfway through the phone playing, the window popped up on it. So the kid wasn't even watching it anymore because something popped up on her phone and I'm watching it going, this is hilarious. They have no idea. See, the funny thing is, is like, is that right or wrong? I don't know. That's not for me to judge. What I do know is technology allows for people to become complacent. Why can't they entertain their children? Why can't they engage their children? Why do they have to put headphones on and watch an iPad in public? I don't know, that's not for me to decide. I'll tell you what we did with my children growing up and not that I'm right or wrong, but my wife still today carries a pack of Uno cards in her purse. And on the weekends, we go to breweries, wineries, we go to restaurants, that's our thing as a family. Sunday is Sunday fun day in the Donch house. Everybody comes to my house. And then we decide if we wanna go out for the day, go apple pick, it's apple season now, right? Every girl looks like Princess Leia, all this bullshit, right? So, <laughs> you know, that's Sunday for us, right? Or we have everybody at the house and we cook a huge meal. You know what we do? We play games. We engage each other. And yeah, the phones are out. I'm on my phone. I'm a social media guy. I'm on my phone all the time, but there's a time and place for it. But you know what we did with my children growing up? We engaged them and made them part of the experience. We played Uno when we go out to dinner before the food comes. So my kids didn't have to be on a tablet or be on their phones. We engaged them. And do you know how many people walk past our table and go, wow, oh, that's, you know, that's really smart. That's cool. Yeah, it's called being invested into your children. It's called being concerned about them and getting away from only worrying about yourself. The people tonight sitting at that table did not have a single thought about their child. They were too engaged in their own conversation and on their own phones. It almost seemed like it was a burden. That's a problem. I'm not saying that you can't do that and put a tablet or a phone in front of a child at times. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. What I am saying though is it's a convenient excuse. See, everything in life, in the fire service, in your personal life, in your marriage, as a father or a mother, every single thing takes work. We're just making it easier and easier to get complacent and have excuses today. It takes work. Something every generation wants, we want to make it easier for the next generation. We always do. My father gave me entitlement because he was able to provide for me. I look at what I do for my children. It's ridiculous what I do for my kids, but I do it. Should I be? Probably not, but I'm doing it anyway. But the one thing I can say on the backside of that is when you raise your children, you raise them with good morals, ethics, and values, and you lead by example. I can give them materialistic things. What do they get from that? Appreciation, love, understanding, knowing what hard work can provide for them. That's important. That's the structure behind it. So I give my kids everything. I spoil them rotten. I got girls, man. My oldest is 30. Michael's out of the house. I spoil him when I can. But I spoil my kids when I can, if I can. But in return, I need to get those phone calls from the teachers that say, your daughters are a pleasure to have in class. I need to get the phone call or the conversation, you know, at the store when one of their friend's moms comes up and says, oh my God, Paige is such a wonderful person. We love having her over. That's how you know you're winning. That's how you know you're winning. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. G. Michael Hoff, it's a cycle. If you read that and think about the generational values, generation after generation, this holds very true. Holds very, very true. I could do a whole program just on this. The one thing we all have in common, we're generation firefighter. I mentioned that before between Billy and Jimmy. 
Generation fireman or firefighter. That's what we share in common. Age doesn't matter, but understanding and mutual respect does. When you go out the door, these guys just went out before with their uh, power call going, right? Their little uh, spinny thing in the front, right? They go out the door, they're going to a call. I don't know who's in that engine, truck, rescue, whatever just rolled out of here. I have no idea who's sitting in the back of that. What I do know is they're all responsibly able to do the same job. So I don't care if you're 20, 40, 60. If you're sitting in that seat and we've given you every single tool, training, tool, education, foundation, we've given you everything you need. I don't give a crap what you look like, how old you are, where you came from. I'm trusting you that you can do your job. That is the beautiful thing about the fire service is when we get to that point, all this other stuff I talked about does not matter. What matters is we're in that seat and we're going to do a job. Think about it. You could hate the guy across from you in that engine, but if you're going to work, that gets put aside, doesn't it? I've been on plenty of fires with guys I can't stand, but we work well together. There's a mutual respect for one another because we're in that seat. We're going to work. We're going to fires. We're working together. There's a mutual respect because age doesn't matter. Color doesn't matter. Religion doesn't matter. Super, super important. So when we get caught up in the minutia of all the bullshit in your firehouse, think about that for a minute. If the tones goes off and Mrs. Smith's house is burning down the road, all that crap that just happened at the monthly meeting doesn't matter. So why do we, let, why do we get caught up in it? Why do we let that run the 90% of the conversation that runs our firehouses? We should be talking about Mrs. Smith and making sure that we have every strategy and tactic in place to affect her safety and save her home. But instead, we're caught up on, we spent too much money on this TV, and this guy's a piece of shit, and this guy sucks, and he doesn't come out. Guy gave him a T-shirt. Who cares? Who cares? Seriously, who cares? Bro, I sit in every... (laughs) This is why I think this program does really well. I walk into places and I give this program and you see guys in the room, they're all like. (laughs) How common is this? Shut up, old man. I used to hear it all the time in my firehouse. The back row guys in the meeting, Thursday night monthly meeting, Monday night meetings, the guys in the back row, the no's. They say no just to say no. You know why they do? Because they're cranky and crusty. They are. I'm going to be one of them. You guys will be one of them. See, the funny thing about the fire service is there has to be a checks and balance. There has to be. We need the crusty guys in the back row, just like I need the guys full of piss and vinegar up front. I need the guys that want everything. I make a motion, $3,000 for Bobby Eckert's training. I make a motion, I buy 10 fast boards. I make a motion, and all the back guys are like, whoa. It's checks and balances, right? Because nobody has patience today. The people that have patience are the older guys. We're going to talk about patience in a little bit. That's the big part of this. So shut up, old man. That's the young pushing against the old. It's everywhere. It's not just in the fire service. It's in life. I look at my father and I today. I get so annoyed with him so fast because as he gets older, his filter's gone. (laughs) 82 years old. And I'm looking at him going, Dad, you can't say that. He's like, ah, whatever, I'll be dead soon. (laughs) Stupid kid. Get it all the time. My father blames millennials for everything. I go, Dad, what's a millennial? Don't worry about it. (laughs) All right. Why are the kids asking why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they're absolutely interested in knowing why. Why can't we tell them? I'll tell you why we can't tell them, because most of you don't have the answers. And instead of saying, I don't know, and taking accountability for your own self, you're going to push back and be like, don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Shut your mouth. Open your ears. You'll learn. We'll teach you. Get out of here. That's crazy. The younger generations have every single answer to every single question within five seconds. We don't do bar trivia anymore because the young guys suck the fun out of that. Right? 
We don't get to argue about who won the different years World Series. I'm not a big sports guy. I'm a fire. I love fire, so I don't. I'm not a big sports guy. But who won the World Series? Who did this? Who did that? What was what year did we walk on the moon? Whatever the trivia is, there's always one in the group that's like, eh, 1965. You suck. Why can't we have conversation for five minutes? Why can't we talk about it? They, it's because the answer's right here. So then bring that to the firehouse. Billy wants to know why it's not doing it to challenge Jimmy. He's not challenging Jimmy. He's actually interested in knowing why. Why is Jimmy afraid to tell him? Because maybe Jimmy's answers, sorry, God, I'm picking on you. Maybe Jimmy's answers aren't right. Maybe he doesn't know. Now he's being held accountable. And what that does is that comes across as a threat. He's now threatened by the young kid. See, the funny thing is today, the young kids are super educated. Who builds fire? I know you build fire trucks, right? Fire trucks, the process, right, Chief? We were just talking about this, right? Bid specs today, when salesmen go into firehouses to sell fire trucks, the truck committees already have spreadsheets and pictures and all this shit. Years ago, the first truck committee I was on, I was like, we want this. And it was like a picture of a red fire truck. <laughs> nowadays, right? Nowadays, spreadsheets, pictures. Look at it. I saw this on National Fire Radio. I saw this on National Fire Radio. I saw this on National Fire Radio. Use our content. It's really good for truck building. So my point is, my point is, times have changed. We have a much more educated system today. Our kids today are a hundred times smarter than I was when I came into fire service, just like having dinner with my daughters. The conversation at dinner, I find myself going, I don't know. I used to have all the answers. I ran a business. I was a fire chief. I used to have all the answers. I find today I don't have any answers because my kids are smarter than me. It's the same thing in the fire service. Our younger generation are, they're intrigued. They want to know why. And when they ask why, it's not a threat. They're not challenging you. So get your ego out of the way. Step off your soapstone. Get down and talk to them on the level and say, I don't know. Let's find out together. That's super hard to do, guys. A lot of people won't do that because now they're on an even playing field. Billy just joined, and I've been here for 40 years, and I don't know. We love the blame. Man, do we love the blame. Super easy. Not my fault. It's your fault. I don't like your hat. It's your fault. Right? I don't like you. It's your fault. It's so easy to blame. And this is not a generational conversation. We love to point fingers and blame others. We never point the finger at ourselves. You know what I started doing? Pointing the finger at myself. And this was part of this whole with maturity is clarity. I've started to really realize that the only way you move forward in life as a better husband, a better father, a better firefighter, a better business owner, is you start owning your own shit. That is super hard to do. And I've been a volunteer fireman for 30 years and I've seen every type of guy and girl come through my firehouse. And I'm sure I wasn't easy and I'm probably still not easy. We have every type, we have everybody coming through and we all love to do this. Take responsibility for who you are. Take responsibility for your decisions and your actions. It will project you forward in life. If you wanna point fingers and blame others, you're gonna go nowhere. And I got a slide that's gonna come up in a little bit that talks about losers. You want to blame anyone? Blame me. Blame National Fire Radio. Blame the cell phone. Blame social media. Blame technology. That's fine. If it's easier for you to sleep at night, blame me. You still got to take accountability for your own actions, though. My point is this. Where are we? What do we want to do? Do you want to move forward, or do you just want to spin your wheels? Are you status quo, or do we want to move forward? The problem is our volunteer firehouses are falling apart. We're losing members at a hot clip. We're not bringing new members in. Let's not talk about recruitment. 
let's just talk about retention. Do better for the people that are already in your firehouses. You can get more out of the people that are there if you treat them right. I have issues in my own fire department right now that I just caught wind of the other day, and I can't believe it about training and guys that missed the class and the academy didn't give him credit, but he was there. And our own guys are ready to hang out our own guys. And I go, what are we doing? Why don't we back our people up? Why don't we believe in our people? Why don't we just jump on the bandwagon of this institution, the fire academy that we all know is effed up? And we're going to take their side? Let's stick up for our people. You know what that does for our people? They're a part of something. They feel empowered. Why the disconnect? There's a disconnect. Foundate, they're back. Foundation, morals, ethics, values, communication, lack of understanding. I can go through all these. We will. Foundation. Solid versus shaky. Listen, foundation is super important. You got to know where you came from so you can go somewhere. But before we can even build the foundation, we have to have solid ground. I had this conversation the other day on a podcast. It was awesome because I brought this up and the guy goes, what do you mean by that? Right? Because the foundation we build. I said, yeah, but before you can build on a piece of land, you got to make sure that ground is solid. If I build a cinder block foundation on sand, it's going to sink, right? So we need to make sure that we get down to the bedrock or limestone or we pour the footings that we need. I'm not a builder. Just trying to play it off like I know what I'm talking about. The point is this. Understanding the ground of what you're building upon is understanding who came before you what the department looked like, the sacrifices of gentlemen and ladies before you, understanding the background. If you want to be a part of something, you better know about it. Rescue One in New York City, a rich, rich tradition. Those guys know a lot of that tradition. Because when you're bought in and you're a part of it and you're a piece of the foundation, we allow you to have a piece of the foundation. You're bought in. Give your people an opportunity to be a part of the organization. Push them to be a part of it. Invite them in. Don't protect it to the point that you won't let others in. We need to let our people in. This one's important to me. Our roots are different, but the mission is the same. We all come from different places. We all come from different backgrounds. When we walk through the door, treat everyone the same. Treat them with the same respect that you would want for yourself or one of your best friends. I watched some beautiful things happen in the volunteer fire service, even for myself growing up. I joined at 18. We didn't have a junior program. I joined our volunteer house at 18 years old. We didn't have juniors. And then the next month after I joined, they started the junior program. You know how pissed I was? I used to chase the fire trucks on my bicycle with my brothers every single day. We used to get yelled at by the chiefs and the officers all the time that the damn Donch kids were chasing the fire trucks on their bikes. We couldn't get enough of it. I want that for my daughter. That was part of that conversation I had with myself when I first didn't want her there. And then I realized, how dare I take that away from her? I've come to realize how good it's been for me. Why wouldn't I want that for her? Why wouldn't I want that for you? Why wouldn't I want that for every single guy and girl in this room? It takes work. So we all come from different backgrounds, but make people feel at home. Different generation, generation firefighter. Different background, this is our house. Welcome. Be a part of it. Morals, ethics, and values, none of us have any of that. The only important thing on the slide right here, that was a joke, guys. Doing the right thing is always doing the right thing. Easier said than done, but think about that for a minute. Doing the right thing is always doing the right thing. I can promise you this, doing the right thing is typically a lot harder than doing the easy thing or doing the wrong thing. Doing the work and doing the right thing takes a lot. Integrity, character, hard work, determination. It's easy to just run with the losers. It's easy to make a shitty decision. It's easy to shoot off the cuff or take a shortcut. It's a lot harder to do the right thing. Doing the right thing is always the right thing. Communication, talking for the sake of talking, who's talking? How do you talk? And part of communication is what? Listening. I talk a lot, as you guys can see. I talk a lot. I actually listen more. I travel all over the country doing this. 
not just this program, but like I said before, visiting firehouses, looking at equipment, talking with people. I get, I, I have the luckiest job in the fire service. I've made buffing professional. It's freaking cool, man, right? So I get to travel all over and I get to do this. I just get to listen. I got Chief Horse sitting here. I've been asking this guy to get on my podcast for five years. Still won't come on my podcast. No pressure. We'll get him on. We just have to link up. But my point is this. I want to listen. See, the problem is when I was young, thanks for joining us. Yep. Oh, is that you were on that spin, the spinny thing with the power call going out of here? What was that, a lift assist? What was that? <laughs> that is worse. Listening, when I grew up in the firehouse, right, I knew everything. I couldn't be told anything. When I was young, I lived at the firehouse. I was there all the time. I did all the work. I did all the chores. Everything revolved around me. I had every answer because I was there all the time. Does that entitle me to anything more? No. Did I think it did? Absolutely. That happens to a lot of people, especially in the volunteer fire service. You feel that you're doing more than others, which makes you feel more entitled because you do more? Uh Uh-uh. Doesn't work that way. You do more because your work ethic makes you want to do more. Your pride makes you want to do more. Your character makes you want to do more. But it does not entitle you to anything more. There's a big distinction there. I was one of those kids, man. Trust me. Remember that slide before where I said, I'm guilty? I'm guilty of every single thing I talk about in this program. I was that kid in the firehouse that put in all my spare time. I lived there. I did everything. Washed the trucks, re-racked hose, swept, mopped, cleaned toilets. I did it all. And then a guy like Jimmy walks in, and I'm like, yeah, thanks for helping. And guess what? Guess what? Jimmy did that 40 years ago. I just wasn't there to see it nor do I respect him enough to even think about that for a minute. I love some of these kids today. I hear them talk and I go, whoa, 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 what? What was that? And they're like, oh, you know. And I'll be like, "Uh uh-uh. I go, listen, you guys are so good, right? I go, I did what you did 30 years ago. We were better. That's fact. See, the funny thing is, is everything goes in a cycle in the firehouse. And those guys that have all those years in, I promise you, worked just as hard as you did, if not harder, and they're not walking around pounding their chest like you are. So I appreciate your work ethic. I appreciate the value you bring to our fire service. I appreciate your character, your integrity, your willingness to work hard, your willingness to come down and let the soda guy in, top off bottles, let the maintenance guy in, do this, do that. I appreciate all that. But it doesn't mean that you're any more special than anywhere else. It's a mission. We are family. The mother and father in most families do more than any of the kids. There shouldn't be this power trip or resentment, especially in the firehouse. I appreciate you being available to do what you do. Thank you. I did that 25 years ago. I do value and appreciate you. Stop dismissing one another. This this pisses me off to no end. And it's not just in the firehouse, this is in life. We talk over each other so fast that we don't let each other even get out an idea or an opinion before we shit all over them. We don't let people have an opinion anymore. We don't have conversation anymore. We've become so polar that it's your way or no way. What are we doing? I used to sit through officers meetings that went for three hours. Can any of you relate to that? ridiculously, none of you will because your chiefs are probably sitting here, right? (laughs) So that laugh tells me I'm dead on point here. Three-hour officers meetings, we get nothing accomplished. My business that I run, a very successful business that I ran for the family, I'd have seven-minute meetings, and I got more done than your three-hour officers meeting for the volunteer firehouse. What are we doing? How about we value our own people's time? 
How about we don't pull them down to the firehouse on a Tuesday night for a three-hour bullshit session that we could have done in 15 minutes on a Zoom or after drill one night? Let's start valuing our people's time. But I went off on a tangent. But my point is this. Appreciate your people and value them. Back to this slide. Stop dismissing one another. We do it all the time. This guy here, I don't know. I should know the like complete story, and I don't. He's from a town in northern New Jersey. I saw it in like the newspaper. I went online and took the photo out. That's why it's crappy looking, the quality. But that guy's like a 98-year-old member of an engine company, and they still let him come to the firehouse and put his coat on and his helmet on if he wants. And if he wants to jump on the truck, they let him jump on the truck. That is a beautiful thing. He needs that. How dare us not allow him to have it? My department, we strip so many older guys of things like that. And I'm like, what are we doing? And I didn't understand the importance of that until I started getting older. Or I started looking at the older guys that I grew up with. And I look at when they come down to the firehouse on drill night, they need that more than I do. They want to sit there and share a beer or have a conversation. They want to tell you the same story every single Monday night training. And how dare you have the audacity not to listen to them? Listen to them. Sorry, I get emotional. My point is this, right? Joe, I'll stay with you, Jim. You're not that old yet, so I got you. Joe in the firehouse has been there for 70 years. He's 90 years old. He's sitting here having a beer after drill. If you guys are allowed to still have beer in the firehouse, whatever, right? He's sitting there and he, hey, Joe, tell me that story. Tell me that story about that fire on Main Street. Oh, Jeremy, let me tell you about that one. We had fire out four windows. We had jumpers on arrival. We had water problems. It was snowing. And that's when you grab these young kids and go, hey, did you ever hear Joe's story before? Get in here. Drag him in. Let Joe tell that story. He needs to tell that story. He's begging and waiting for somebody to ask him. Ask him. How dare you have the audacity not to care or not to engage? He's a brother. He sits at our table. Ask Joe about the fire. And what's fun about that is next week when he comes, hey, Joe, tell me about that fire on Main Street again. Jeremy, it was out 12 windows. We had, four, we had 14 nuns on fire out in the street. The stories keep going. They need that. So stop dismissing them. Don't let those old guys sit in the corner. I'm getting goosebumps talking about this because I'm so passionate about this. Because I appreciate all these guys because they did so much for me growing up in fire service. And now it's my job bridging the gap, Generation X, to get them to tell their stories so that the younger kids know. Which goes back to foundation. The foundation of our fire department. You learn the stories through our people. Don't dismiss them. Don't, out, don't push them out. Don't make them feel ostracized. If anything, let them have their own chairs. Put their frickin' name on them. Invite them in. Ask them to come down. Joe, take the leftovers home. Joe, let me pack up a to-go plate for you. Do your wife want anything? You need anything? These people matter. They matter. Stop dismissing them and pull somebody new into the conversation. Oh, crap, I did it again. Stop dismissing each other. This poor girl gets walked all over in the firehouse. We're not even looking at her. She doesn't exist to me. She's too new. She doesn't know anything. We dismiss them too. Why? Let them ask the why. Work with them to understand where they're coming from. Give them your time. Here's my problem in the volunteer firehouse. Our department's doing upwards of seven, 800 runs a year, all fire. It's a home response department. We're not a big department, but we run. We've got a decent amount of fires, a lot of mutual aid fires. I get back from a call. I go over, sign in. I'm like, all right, guys, I'll see you at the next one. And I'm out the door. 20 years ago, we sat on that bumper for another 20 minutes. We had that conversation. We cracked a beer. Two o'clock in the morning, get back from a CO alarm. We're like, hey, who wants one? Yeah, let's crack one open. You know how important that is? And now me, because I'm so busy. What's your name? Lauren. I'm so busy, I don't give Lauren those 20 minutes on the front bumper. She learns 
from those 20 minutes. Those kids sit there and take it all in. And they just watch the senior guys, the guys that are respected in the firehouse, have conversation. Joe, remember that fire we had? We were hanging out last time here and shit. We went out the door two bells later. They get to listen to that. That's foundational. See, the problem is, is me, my department, I could go out the door 10 times on a day. So if I'm running from home, going to the firehouse, running out on a bullshit alarm, going back home 20 minutes later, going out the door to the firehouse again, we don't have the time. And I, I recognize that, and I can appreciate it. Trust me, if anybody doesn't have the time, it's me. I promise you that. My point is, we have to make time. We have to find a way that Lauren and Billy have time to sit at the bumper and listen to guys like me and Jimmy talk about the old days, talk about the fires, talk about the things that make our department great. That's how you get buy-in. But when we come and go, we become a transient fire department. Guess what happens? Nobody's there to teach them now. I used to go to the firehouse on a Friday at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There's six guys there. You walk in. You're like, hey, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? Hey, I don't feel like going home yet. The old lady's beating me up. I don't want to be there. Right? And we'd hang out till 8 o'clock at night until we're all getting yelled at. But what comes from that? It's not just the foundational fire stuff. It's also the friendships. It's also the camaraderie, the brotherhood that we want out of this. See, firefighting's funny because we don't go to that many fires. The calls are the small part of it. It's all the other cool stuff we get to do. This is the coolest institution in the world. I don't know any. I know a couple of you. But now I feel like I know all you. And you know me. I'm just pouring my guts out up here telling you my story. I'm not afraid to do that because we're family. It's the fire service. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of that. You shouldn't be either. That's why we need to go all in. We need to go all in on our young kids. We need to spend 20 minutes after the call having a conversation. We need to stop being petty. We need to talk about the upside and not the downside. Those are all things that are important. They need it more than we know. They need it more than we know. What are we all lacking time? I just talked about that, right? Excuses, it's easier to brush off. We need to invest the time. I can't, I cannot stress that enough. The top line's funny, right? Because we always say we're so busy. Like nowadays, Sam will call me, hey, Jeremy, I got this idea. What's going on? How you been? I'm like, oh, I'm so busy. I don't be, I'm not like, hey, Sam, I wish I had more money. We don't complain about that. We always complain about how busy we are, how we have no time. But I can promise you if Sam calls me and goes, hey, Jeremy, you want to go grab a stogie? You want to have a cigar? I'm going to find time for that. It's prioritizing your time. We all say we have no time and we all talk about how busy we are. I promise you, you will always find time for the things that are important to you. So maybe every once in a while, we need to prioritize our fire companies. Maybe every once in a while, we need to prioritize our time back to our friends, our people, our young people. We always will have time. It's what's important to you. Lack of understanding and respect. Adversity can be a huge asset. I talked about that before. We don't care who you are, where you come from, what you look like. Maturity comes with clarity. We talked about that. The line on the bottom is important to me. Everyone wants to be right, and compromise is always hard. Nobody wants to compromise because we always want to be right. Red, blue, there's no purple. We're polar, Republican, Democrat. We're polar. We don't allow for conversation anymore. All we do is take a position and stand on it. We dismiss one another. We don't or care to understand where other people are coming from. Compromise is hard. It takes a big person to compromise. Respect, a little Aretha. It's a two-way street. I talk about respect that I talked about a little bit before. When you walk into the firehouse, Whoever walks in, we should give them respect up front. And respect is different than trust. But I flip the conversation and say this. Let's give everybody the respect they deserve. It's theirs to lose, not theirs to gain. It's theirs to lose. Give them the respect when they walk in the door. Treat them like a human being and an equal. And if they prove you differently, well, then you form your own opinions. Let's not make them work for it. We're not all high and mighty. Give it to them when they walk through the door. Respect is earned. 
that old saying. Um, it's not their fault. We love to blame the generation. It's a generation's fault. The problem is, whoever you're blaming, you raised. So if I want to blame my kids and their generation alpha or Gen Z or the millennials, I raised them. Isn't that my fault? That's very hard for people to grasp. As a parent, you raise your children. Your children is a byproduct of your parenting. It's your responsibility. It's your fault if they suck. Same with your firefighters. If your firefighters are terrible, they're not trained, they don't understand the mission, they don't care, they're not bought in, it is your fault. You raised them, you taught them, you trained them, or maybe you didn't. It is your fault. We love to blame. But start looking in the mirror, because I can promise you that's the only way you start making progress is when you accept responsibility. You want to blame the younger kids? It's your fault. They come from a different place. I talked about it with all the characteristics of the different generations. They're coming from somewhere different. As an older guy or girl in the fire department, you have the audacity not to learn a different way to communicate with the next generation. It's your way or no way. That's the poison in our firehouses right now. It's not always the younger kid's fault. I promise you that. And a lot of times, it's the older guy's fault. They're not willing to compromise. They're not willing to figure out a different way to communicate. They're not more open-minded. But then they go home and they sit with their kids and they're a big mush. Why do you have to maintain one persona at the firehouse and a different one at home? I don't know. The fire service is funny that way. It really is. We wear a lot of different hats in life, but it's not their fault. It is not. It's the generation before. It's the generation that raised them. Your fire department's not clicking. Start at the top, not at the bottom. It's the top. See, that's the beautiful thing about this conversation is when it's generational, I get to talk about everybody. And I get to point the finger at the old crusty guys, and I get to point the finger at the kids, and I get to point the finger at the middle. That's me. I get to do that because I'm guilty of all of it. I was a chief. I was a line officer. I'm now a senior guy in the firehouse, right? I wore all those hats. I was a probie. I was a probationary fireman, uh, uh, you know, all the different layers in the fire service. I was all of it. I can speak to it. Keep hitting the wrong button. More diverse, the better. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us understand it. It makes us better. I believe that wholeheartedly. I love sitting around the kitchen table and having people with all different backgrounds different ethnicities and religions and learning about them. I think it makes us better. I think that when you're on the fire truck with an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, a car salesman, an accountant, an attorney, we are better for that because we lean on each other's strengths on calls. Why don't we do that in the firehouse? The more diverse we are, the better we are. Patience. I was just talking about this with the fellows in the back. We lack patience today more than ever. Remember, bar trivia, we live in a world of immediacy. Right here. I don't have patience anymore. We want everything now. Amazon will deliver you. My wife orders packages, and they show up the same day. It's outrageous. We have, within a 20-minute drive of my house, probably 15 different Amazon warehouses. We have four or five Amazon drivers show up every day. <laughs> Not kidding. Two teenage girls at home and my wife. I promise you, Amazon knows us by name and they know us really well. My point is this, immediacy. We live in a world today of immediacy. The problem is change doesn't happen fast. And a lot of times when change tries to happen fast, it doesn't work. It doesn't stick. See, change is good, but change for the sake of change is not. We need to have more patience. We need to debate. We need to have conversation. We need to find the purple and not the red or the blue. 
We need to have conversation. We need to be able to debate each other. The pros, the cons, the crusty guys say no, the young kids say yes. What's the middle ground? Are you willing to compromise? Are you willing to find the middle ground? Easy is fast, hard is slow. The fire service is not built on shortcuts. I promise you that. One of the best things I ever heard was we want to teach the tricks of the trade, but nobody's learned the trade. We're so fast to find different ways to do things, shortcuts, quicker, because we do it in life. The iPhone, you swipe this way, it does this. You swipe that way, it does this. I remember the flip phone. I remember a beeper. We used to have beepers, and if there was a fire, the page would go out. It said 1075 on it. You'd be like, shit, who's burning? You'd have to like run over to a phone and call someone, right? We've made things quicker. We don't have the patience we once had. We want everything now. I promise you this, take the slow road. Make it difficult for yourself. The reward is 10 times over. Patience continued. It's just learn the job. Firefighting is a long-term play. It's not a short career. It's over before you know it. Chief Horst will tell you that. How many years, Chief? In Harrisburg? 35. 35 years. And how quick did it go? Right. And that's a colorful career. That's going to fires. That's doing the work goes fast. What's the rush? Don't rush the process. We live in an immediate world today. We no longer have patience. We want everything now. This is a long game. 35 years in Harrisburg, 50 plus years in the fire service, still learning every single day. He's a student, not just a teacher. He's a student. It is a process. What's the hurry? I tried to hurry it up when I was a kid. I promise you that. I wanted my helmet to get dirty. I wanted to look salty. I wanted to be the best fireman. I thought I knew everything. You get my town. I got off the truck, Halligan, and a, and a hook, and I go walking in. I'm a truck guy tonight. What an asshole, right? <laughs> I mean, think about it, right? My point is this. I was rushing it. I didn't even know what to do with those tools at that time. You know what I'm saying? Don't rush the process. There are no shortcuts. I promise you, if you want to be bigger and better, you will get there. But it takes time. There is nothing wrong with being a three-year firefighter. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't need you to be a 10-year firefighter if you're not at that level. I don't need you to be a 25-year. And the thing is this, time doesn't matter. If you're in a super busy department going to fires every single day, your experience level at three years could be a 12-year guy somewhere else. Time doesn't matter. Your commitment, devotion, dedication, and craft does. Are you going to training? Are you working with training groups? Are you going and getting yourself better? Are you reading? Are you going to meetings? Are you going to conferences? What are you doing to make yourself better? You want to advance your career? Double down on it. Don't just take a shortcut. Don't be one of those guys sitting on the front of the bumper just bullshitting at the firehouse. Do something at the firehouse. It's better. It makes you better. Positioning. You got to know where you belong. Like the fire ground, right? Three-man engine, four-man engine, five-man truck, six-man truck. You know your riding position if that's how you operate. Great. You know where you need to be five steps ahead of where you need to be. You know what your job is. You know where you need to be. Parlay that into the firehouse. Know where you fit in. If you know that you have to make the rear, New York City, their OV has to make it. The roof guy has to get into position. What's really cool is departments that are well-oiled, there's no radio traffic unless something's going wrong. In the volunteer world where we don't get to do it every day, be advised. We're trying to get tier. We're working on this. Don't tell me that. Tell me when you can't do your job. That's all I want to know. If you can't make position, if we can't get that line, if water's going to be delayed, those are the things I want to know. I don't need you to give me the play-by-play. -play. And if you say be advised, shove that mic up your ass. I hate it. I hate it. Know where you belong. So if you know where you belong on the apparatus, you know the equipment you need to, to carry, and you know the job that you have to do, and you know that part, then know where you fit in. 
the X's and O's. You know where you're supposed to fit in. It's not just the fire ground. It's also in the fire company. It's also here. It's asking Jimmy 50 plus years. Hey, Jimmy, you need a beer? I'll got it for you. That's fitting in. That's knowing what you're supposed to be doing. Chief Horse sitting over here. Engage him. That guy will tell you story after story and make you better. Know where you fit in. Super, super important. Environment. Everybody know who this guy is? Biff. If you don't know, you got work to do. Back to the Future, Michael J. Fox. That's Biff. He's the dumb guy, the bad guy. Okay? The point is this. He's a loser. He's an absolute loser. If you have losers in your firehouse and you hang out with losers, you're a loser. I was a loser. I'm pretty cool now. Thank you. I was. When I was young, I thought I knew the job. I thought I knew everything. You couldn't tell me anything I didn't know already. I had the answers. I would tell you. I was the softiest fireman at 25 years old, man. I was so good, nobody could tell me anything. I was a loser. Hanging out at the firehouse, kicking my feet up, telling stories like I've been there for 30 plus years. What a joke. We have guys and girls like that in every single firehouse across this country. Those are the ones that are holding back our culture. Those are the ones that we can't get more out of because they just don't want to. They found a home and they're allowed to thrive. Losers love losers. I don't want to be a loser. I figured out one day when I was standing there with the same group of guys night after night that my life wasn't going anywhere that the same guys are at the firehouse every single night. We're not meeting people. We're not talking to girls. We're not going to different firehouses and meeting other guys. We're waiting for that automatic fire alarm to come in. We're talking about the old fire that we had. Oh, remember that brush fire we went to? What are we doing? Those are all important things talking about the past. But if that's all you have and that's all you're dwelling on, you are not moving forward. I want progressive people. I want people that are excited, that are looking for change, looking for excitement. Instead of sitting on the bumper smoking cigarettes all night, stretch a line, throw a ladder, clean the bay, do something, be value added. You hang with Biff, you're a loser. The thirds. Now, disclaimer, I might have stolen this from somewhere and made it my own. I don't know. I... <laughs> So I don't listen to, uh, I really don't listen to any other fire service podcasts. Um, I listen to entrepreneurial business, uh, conspiracy theories, all that type of stuff. But I don't listen to uh, conspiracy theorists over here. Love it. We'll put on our tinfoil hats later. I don't listen to fire service podcasts. I read articles. Uh, read social media. I digest a ton of fire service stuff all day. Remember, I listen more than I talk. I promise you I do. I know what's happening in the fire service. I have my finger on the pulse of it. I know people throughout the entire industry, some of the biggest names, business, industry, firefighters, you name it. I'm in so many different circles these days that I know what's happening in the fire service all over the country. I promise you that I do. I've gotten to be able to get to that point, and I'm so humbled to be in the circles that I'm in. This, I might have stolen because I don't think I'm smart enough to figure this out for myself, but I made it my own. So what I'm getting at is I don't listen to podcasts, but I feel like I, I heard this somewhere. So if you know somebody that talks about it, please tell me so I can look them up and then give them credit if that's where I heard it. The thirds. Third and a third and a third. All-stars, average, losers. Double down on your winners. Who cares about your losers? The average can come up. We spend so much time in the fire service dealing with the losers that our all-stars and winners suffer because of it. We're out training. The all-stars, the winners, they blow through the prop in two seconds. What do we do? We sideline them. Now the losers are like, I can't get this door open. Basic remedial shit. 
And now we have to double down on our losers to get them through the prop so we have some sense of accomplishment that we got the losers through the prop. The losers don't want to be there. They don't want to excel. They don't want to come up. Why are we wasting so much time and resources on them? The average, the middle, will come up if you create an environment where winners win. I challenge fire chiefs and commissioners, line officers, you take your winners and give them every single thing they want. You give them tools, equipment, training, conferences, meals, I don't care. Give your winners what they need to continue to win. Because when you feed your winners, people want to win. When you sideline your winners, you will lose. When you concentrate on the bottom third, the losers, they will bring your organization down. Losers rarely can come up. I called myself a loser in the conversation before. I really wasn't. I just realized I was getting stagnant. I was average. I should have been doing more. I should have been better. And I'm yelling at this point now because this is super important to me. I watch so many fire departments double down on their losers, and it chases all the winners away. Give your winners what they need to win. Your best fire companies do not have losers in them. They don't, especially in the volunteer sector. If you maintain a high level of proficiency and ownership within your company, losers don't want to be there. They can't be there because they can't thrive there because it's not even tolerated. The busiest and best fire companies in this country don't have to deal with shit bags because the system pushes them out. Why do you want them in your firehouse? I don't want them in mine, and I have some. But you know what we don't do? I don't dwell on them. I don't let them have a say. I don't give them extra time. If they want extra time, go get it yourself. We've tried. We've tried to give you what you need. We've tried to give you what you want. And you don't want to rise up, I'm done. I need to focus on my winners. Because when I give my winners everything, and we go to fires, and you walk into that mutual aid fire, and that mutual aid chief's like, bingo, they're here, get in there. And your guys go to work, and they come out professional. They trim those windows out. They open those doors up. They clean up those cuts. Sign of true professionalism. And they come back out. They let their tools do the talking. They put their shit back on the rig, get cleaned up, and they're hungry for another one. Who doesn't want to be a part of that crew? I'll tell you who. The losers. Because they can't work at that level. Because that level takes winners. That level takes people like you that are here on your night to learn, to listen, to want to do more. So I promise you this, double down on your winners. When you win, it's because of your winners. There's not a single team in history that wins because of their losers. Promise you that. You can do this in your organization. I know in the volunteer fire service, we talk all the time about we need people. We have to get the truck out the door. We need to do this. I promise you, if we're just filling seats with anyone, we're going to lose. Somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to die. We don't get to play that game in the fire service. The public calls us for professional service day in and day out. They don't give a shit who you are, what your problems are, what your company problems are. They don't care. They expect you to arrive and do a professional job. Proficient and professional. They don't care that little Jimmy got his feelings hurt because he didn't get a sweatshirt because he didn't make his percentage. So now he didn't want to come out or he didn't come to training night. And now all of a sudden he's sitting in a barman position and he can't open the damn door. Loser. We don't need losers in this business. My opinion. You can argue with me all you want. Double down on the winners. That's it. Double down on your winners, and I promise you, your organization will win. Be a winner, create an environment for winners, blah, 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 blah. I just went through all that. Mission over me. This is kind of cliche, but I'm going to talk about it real quick. Two names on the coat. I didn't come up with this one. I know I stole that from someone, right? Department name, your name, right? I look at it this way. If you make a decision based upon the betterment of your organization every single time, you'll never make the wrong decision. Let me repeat that. 
If you make a decision based upon what's best for your organization, your company, your department, your crew, you'll never make the wrong decision. It is only when you insert yourself, your feelings, into the conversation, you now become selfish. So mission over me, if you allow for the mission to be the most important part of your decision making, you're not going to make the wrong decision. It is only when you insert yourself into the conversation could you potentially make the wrong decision. We have one job, life protection of property. That's it. We're firefighters. That's it. It is that simple. Let's not complicate it. That means everything leading up to this, my decisions have to be to make sure we do this. If I have to insert myself into one of the decisions, well, I might do what's best for me now and not for them. Stop saying no, Nancy Reagan. You guys remember this crack epidemic? Probably not. You guys even know what crack is? I don't know. Some of you might. Anyway. It was a good time years ago, you know? Nancy Reagan, she had a campaign that came out and said, just say no. It was about cocaine and crack back in the day, in the 80s. Just say no. The problem is in the fire service today, all we do is say no. I go away for the weekend. I go to a conference. I come home. Hey, Cap. I was in, uh, where are we? What town is this? Bethlehem. I was in Bethlehem over the weekend at this conference. Super cool front bumper load. Love it. 150, just like ours, but the way they deploy it, I think it could work really. Nope. Nah. We've had our load like this forever. We don't. Why would we change it? We're fine. Just because you go to a conference over the weekend that you probably paid for out of pocket. What are you, a loser? And you're like, wait, what? No, I learned this really cool way. I could grab the coupling, grab the nozzle. I could pull 150 out. Ours is convoluted. It's not packed right. Like, I got this idea. I saw this. Not interested. We say no all the time. Because the guys that have the power to say no are typically threatened. See, the funny thing is when Lauren goes to training and comes home, she just bettered herself. And that freaking guy in the front seat that's been the captain of the truck company for the last 25 years hasn't been to training in 25 years. So now Lauren shows up and says, hey, I'd love to try this. What do you think? And the captain's like, no, nah. nope. He doesn't want to promote her. See, the problem is losers will never promote winners because it makes them look bad. So we have a management problem in the fire service. We have terrible leaders today. We have terrible officers, terrible chiefs that are in positions too long. They've lost sight of what's important. I'll call it out. I don't care. It happens in every fire department, right? What are we doing about that? If you're running a culture of no, you're going to lose. We want to empower our people. And the only people that will empower their people are confident leaders. They're confident in their own skills and abilities. If I'm not proficient at something, why would I let Lauren show me up in front of 18 guys? I'll never let her do that. So I'm going to keep her down. I'm going to tell her no. Now, I'm not saying everything's a yes. Don't get me wrong. There has to be a fine line with that, right? And the yes doesn't come like, let's try this. I saw this at a training conference. Let's try this on the fire ground. Nope. We've been doing it this way because we've been doing it this way. If you have a new way, we'll talk about it. But why don't we do this, Lauren? You learned how to stretch a new load of 150 off the front bumper, inch and three quarter. Cool. Let's drill on ours tonight. And then when we're done stretching ours three or four times on simulated car fires, trash fires, whatever, right? If that's how we run it, let's pack it back up. We'll stretch it. Good. Pack it up. Stretch it. Everybody's proficient how we do it. Now let's try your way. A confident boss, a confident leader will empower Lauren to stand up in front of the group and say, Lauren, show us how to pack this thing. Now it's your turn. So now you got to shine, right? You pack it, this and that. Now we train on it. We pull it. We pull it again. Lauren, doesn't work. Okay. I, you know, I thought it worked. You know, I don't think it's going to work for us. I appreciate you bringing it to the table, but we're going to go back to the old way. A couple things happened there. One, you empowered her. You gave her a voice and an opportunity in front of the crowd. 
as a boss, you just gave her an incredible boost. Even if it doesn't work, you gave her an opportunity to try it. That goes so far. There's a trust, a level of concern that she spent time learning and wanting to make our department better. She wants to make our company better. How dare I tell her no? Let's tell her yes and empower her to show us. It doesn't mean that it's right, but we can give her an opportunity. Now, she can pack it, we can pull it, do it again, and everybody's standing there going, shit, <laughs> it's pretty good. Maybe we should run it like that for a while. Lauren, show us how to do this again. Now there's incredible buy-in. A confident boss, a confident leader will allow that to happen. A person who is not confident in their own skills and abilities will never, ever empower their people. That is where we are in the fire service today. We have people in positions that don't belong in those positions making decisions, and what they're doing is holding back everybody else behind them. If you're not promoting your people, if you're not looking to make your company better, your department better, you're doing it wrong. You need to allow for the young and the excitable to be a part of the conversation. Do not hold them back. Figure out how to communicate with them and empower them. They will make your organization better and you guys will become winners. Be the change. I get this all the time. Jeremy, I'm in a shitty little firehouse. Nobody wants to train. I'm so great. I, I throw ladders by myself. I stretch lines all by myself. Nobody ever wants to work with me. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, man, you're in a tough spot, but I promise you this, you're like everyone in this room. There's so many people. I get this every single day from people all over the country. You have any advice for me? I go, yeah, you do you. Don't ever sacrifice your morals, ethics, or values for the slug next to you. You don't need to stand against the bumper and smoke cigs. You can throw ladders. You want to be better? Be better. I got work to do. Every slide I put up here, I tell you I'm guilty. I need to work out more. I finally got back in the gym the last two months. I'm walking every morning now. I'm making a commitment to my physical health more than I've ever made before in a long time because I was unhappy and not happy who I am. I'll talk about that. I don't care. But it's my responsibility. I started getting slow on the fire ground. I'm watching these kids start to run circles and I go, shit, I better pick up my game. That means I better get my aerobic activity up. I better start getting some more strength in my arms. I want to be in there hooking as long as they are plus 10 more minutes. That's me holding myself accountable. Are you holding yourself accountable? I'm guilty. I promise you, I'd, I'm not perfect. Being the change takes time. We talk about patience. Continue to do what's right for you. If nobody else wants to train, it doesn't mean you don't have to. And I promise you this, as tough as that sounds, and I'm sure a lot of you have gone through it and you're like, nobody wants to get involved. So what? You do you, because on the fire ground, it's your ass. So you get yourself in a place that you're comfortable. And if you want to train, you train. You be the change. I promise you this. If somebody sees how proficient you're becoming, and you guys go to a nice rocking job, and all of a sudden, Billy's throwing the loud. He's throwing that 24 by himself, taking glass, going in, whatever. Whatever his task is, and he's doing it like this, I promise you everybody's noticing on the fire ground. And then all of a sudden, there's validation. You go, maybe he's on to something. And I promise you, if you're out throwing that 24 by yourself, somebody's going to come. Somebody will come. And if they don't, screw them. Go find somebody else that will. See, the beautiful thing about today is there's more opportunity than ever in the fire service. If you don't have a mentor in your own firehouse, you don't have somebody to look up to, you don't have somebody you want to emulate that's giving you the nuggets, go find them because you can. You can find whatever you're looking for today. Go find it. The one thing I want to challenge you, though, is this bottom line here. Gerard Mann, he's a friend of mine. He's from Australia. He's a fireman in Australia. Had him on the podcast. He shared a great story with you, and I know it's getting late, so I want to move, but I want to share this story. This goes the other way, too. This, this line right here, do not beat your chest. See, part of the problem is, is the younger guys that are out there pushing themselves to get good and train, they got a chip on their shoulder a lot of times. And now they start pounding their chest. Look at me, guys. I'm better than you. You guys stand around. 
lazy. I'm out here throwing this ladder. And it almost becomes a highlight reel for him to show off. And he's beating his chest. You know what those guys don't want? You anymore. So you have to still get buy-in, right? So I challenge you, don't beat your chest. But my story with Gerard Mann is this. In his firehouse in Melbourne or wherever he was stationed at the time, he had a young kid who was really into fitness. Gerard Mann's like this tall. This blah, I mean, he's a huge dude. Not fat. Just big, big dude. So he's like, he's talking with that funny accent, right? And he's telling me the story. And he goes, this guy's all into physical fitness and he runs marathons and he always wants to train and work out. He's like, that's great. We do that on shift, but not every shift. And he goes, this guy would stand there and beat his chest and tell us like how, you know, we're not living up to what we should be doing and he's better than us. And he's coming off that way. He's really rubbing the whole crew wrong. And this is the, you know, the bosses, senior men, everybody rubbing them wrong. And so the one day the guy's like, hey, why don't we work out? And they're like, no, we're going to go upstairs and throw darts. And the kid's like, what do you, like, darts are more important than, like, working out, lifting weights, whatever. And so they went up, did darts. The kid didn't partake. When they were done, when he was done working out, he came upstairs, and all the guys are in the lounge throwing darts, and they're all laughing. They're having a good time. They got their arms around each other, telling stories. And the kid walks in, and he's looking at them all, and Gerard goes, this is what you don't understand. You value the fitness part, but you don't understand what's happening in here. Throwing darts can be a drill, too. We need to connect with our people. You're too busy saying, look how great I am because you're outside throwing at 24 all the time or lifting weights, but you're missing the company aspect. You're missing that drill of throwing darts and learning what your boyfriend's name is, what your girlfriend's name is, who your kids are, having a laugh. Those are important moments, too, in the firehouse. Don't lose sight of that. You can be the change. If you don't like what's happening in your firehouse, be the change. But don't isolate yourself to the point that you're not going to be effective anymore to the whole. Does that make sense? Okay. Community, we love community, blah, blah, blah. We're going to, oh, I want to hit on this one. So like I said, when I was younger, um, well, let me back up even before that, the top line there. We always talk about like-minded firefighters. We want to be with like-minded firefighters. I want to go to a conference and surround myself with like-minded people. That's great. I love it. I do it. Don't lose track of the fact that when you get into an area of all like-minded people, it can become an echo chamber. And now you start believing all the bullshit that's being spewed there. There's no checks and balances anymore. Keep some people in your life that will keep you grounded. Like-minded people are great. Find a couple people that have different opinions than you and value them. They will make you think twice because when you sit in a room of 65 people and we all feel the same way, we all go out of here chanting and nobody's, there's no checks and balance anymore. So be careful of that. Like-minded people are great, but keep a couple people in your life that will keep you honest. You get in that echo chamber, you lose track of the mission a lot of times, okay? That's just my own experience. Down here, dumbest in the room. I love being the dumbest guy in the room. I told you earlier on when I was a slug, when I was a loser, I thought I knew everything in the fire ground. I thought I was God's gift to firefighting at 25 years old. I've come to realize I am not. And in fact, I am pretty bad at it. Not true. I think I'm okay. But my point is, I'm in text groups, circles, with the biggest names of the American Fire Service. People that six years ago, I was reading their articles and loving to even just shake their hand, and now they're personal friends of mine. I sit in these circles, and man, I'm telling you, I don't say a word. I just listen. Some of the best names, the most inspirational people, the people that have laid the foundation of building construction and fire attack and hose and ladder company work, you name it. I have these people in my life now. I love being the dumbest guy in that room. I used to think I always had to speak. I used to think I always had to have something to say. But man, when you get in that right environment and you don't have anything to say, you know you're out of your league. I'm a very lucky man for the exposure that I've gotten in the fire service, and I appreciate being the dumbest guy in the room. It's important. Sit with winners, the view is very different. 
You want to be a loser? Sit on that front bumper, smoke your cigs, and talk about the dumpster fire from last week. You want to be a winner? Surround yourself with winners and go. Go. Opportunities, I talked about this. We have more opportunities than ever before, especially the younger generation. You want to know why you're not getting firefighters into your firehouses? Why do they need to? What are we doing to promote what we do and why they want to be there? My kids can flip Nikes online and make $150,000 a year. Why the hell would they be a firefighter? Kids today have more opportunities than ever before. What are we doing as organizations to attract them and to compete with that? And I talk to career departments all over the country. Numbers are down in every city to get hired. Numbers are down. Some areas can't hire enough people. It's because we haven't made the job good enough or competitive enough with the options that people have today. People have more opportunity today than ever. And the flip side of that is you have more opportunity, and I talked about it. If you're looking for a mentor, you're looking for information, you're looking for more, you guys are in the perfect time because you can go find that. Opportunity is abound, and that is one of the biggest hurts of the American Fire Service. Fact versus feeling. You want to have a conversation? Great. Keep your feelings out of it. We'll get to a solution. Everything today is polar, red and blue. I've been talking about it. Yep. And you know what all that is fueled by? Emotion. If you take your feelings out of the conversation at the firehouse and you talk fact, we'll get to a conclusion very quickly. And we'll know what's right and we'll know what's wrong. We insert our feelings into everything we do nowadays because we think our feelings matter. I have news for you. They don't. They don't. Mrs. Smith doesn't freaking care about your feelings. If her house is on fire, she doesn't care what's going on in your life. She doesn't care about the politics in your firehouse. You need to be there for her. Get your feelings out of the way. Put fact and we win. Other words that matter, entitlement. Yep, it's everywhere. Terrible leaders create it. Entitlement, what time is it? I don't want to hold you guys too long. It's almost 9.30, so we'll wrap in a couple minutes here. Um, dare we blame the other generations? I kind of hit on all that. Accountability, stop playing defense. Nobody likes to play defense. Who wants to go to a fire and play defense? I hate going to fires and not being able to get inside, right? All this, like, tenable space, survival space, right? Yeah. I've had so many terrible chiefs growing up in the fire service, not just in my own department, but chiefs that we go to fires with. You got a two-and-a-half-story wood frame, fully involved. Yep, you go around the back and you go, I don't know, porch is on fire, but the rest of the house isn't. I'm sure it's happened to all of you, right? Why do we want to go defensive? We don't. We fight fire from the inside out. So why are we playing defense in life? Let's get on the offense. Let's go. Let's go. I'm tired of playing defense with everything. Anytime we talk about something, it's like, wow, are we going to get in trouble? Are we going to do this? Is this going to happen? Or legality? Everybody loves legality. Come on. How many times do we get sued? It's crazy. We hide behind shit. We do. We make excuses. We play defense. How about we double down and go offense? I love going offensive. This is important to me, too. Honesty, integrity, and character, super important. I've grown over the years to become a much better individual than I used to be. I promise you that. I really have. And I'm proud of the person I am today. My wife will tell you I've changed. My kids have seen me change. National Fire Radio has held me accountable more than anything in my life. Because if I'm going to stand up here and tell you my story and be vulnerable with you, I have to own it. I am transparent. You listen to my podcast, I'll tell you almost everything. I don't care because it's the only way we can gain trust. It's the only way we can build community. I challenge you to be the same. But who are you as a person outside of the firehouse? If you are a piece of shit in your life, you are a piece of shit in the firehouse. Sorry. It works that way. If you're a bad father, be better. If you're a bad mother, do better. If you're a terrible spouse, do better. Because all that parlays and translates right into the firehouse. We know who you are. We see you. So bring your A game. I challenge you. This, this presentation is not just for the fire service. I can do this in the corporate level. I do keynotes for businesses. I speak in all different areas. 
this lesson or this, this, I don't mean lesson, but this presentation could be brought into any industry, right? Who are you outside of the firehouse? I challenge you to be the best person you can possibly be. I learned that through my story and it's made me better. That's important. My handshake matters today. My word matters. When I look at you in the eye and say, thank you, I appreciate you, I truly mean that. Do you? Important. Expectations. We have a responsibility in the fire service to tell you what we want from you. We love holding people accountable for shit they don't even know they were responsible for, right? Happens in every firehouse. Happens in business. We hold people responsible, but did we even teach them that? Do they know they're supposed to be responsible for that? These stupid kids, they don't wash the trucks anymore. They don't clean up the firehouse. They don't take the garbage out. They don't do the dishes after drill. All this shit. Have you ever sat down and explained it to them? Remember those generations that need constructive criticism? They need to be told what to do, but they appreciate that and they value that. Have we done that? No, we haven't because we're just like, you're supposed to know. No, they're not. We fall down on this all the time. Nostalgia. How freaking cool is this, right? Open cab. Chief Horse probably remembers some of these days. Not trying to age you, Chief, but dog riding on the back step, hip boots, smoking cigs, no coats. It's freaking cool, right? I grew up in the shadow of New York City in the fire service, so for us, the influence of New York City was huge, right? We had Max all over, right? We had uh, aerial scopes everywhere. Like, that was, our, that was our area. I grew up in that. The nostalgia of the war years, that shit carries over to all the volunteer houses outside of New York City. That is so cool. None of us in this room, maybe a few, could do what they did. I'm telling you, we're softer, we're weaker. These guys would go to work, go to 15 fires, go home for 12 hours, come back and do it all over again. We have guys that tap out for a broken finger. You don't think these guys broke fingers every night? You don't think these guys got burned, threw up, got cut, and went back to work the next day? I promise you this, we can't hold a candle to these guys. Hip boots, long coats, rode the back step. I wish we went to more fires. I don't know, do you? Have a real conversation with yourself. You want to go to two, three fires a night? I guarantee you're all going to say yes. And then when you leave here tonight and you're driving home, you're like, man, I would kick my ass if I went to three fires tonight. And then do that tour and tour and tour again. Different animal. Nostalgia is cool. We all love it, but we lack the understanding and patience to appreciate it. And that really sums up what this program is. Do better. It takes work. All of us. And with that, my friends, that is it. Thank you very much for tonight. National Fire